the Golden Horde, the state of Jochi. Weapons. When about 750 years ago, the state of the Golden Horde arose in the vast expanses of Eurasia. It was called Ulu'ulus, or the state of Jochi, after the name of the Han Jochi, who was the eldest son of Genghis Khan. The victories of the Mongol armies depended not only on the abilities of their military leaders to conduct warfare, but also on their weapons, ammunition of their soldiers, and having siege weapons. Military equipment of the Golden Horde military leaders was distinguished by an exceptionally luxuriant decoration. Ornate helmets and armor set them apart from ordinary warriors, giving them the necessary status. But the armor was not only exquisite, above all, it was also functional, reliable, durable, and convenient in battle. A warrior whose main weapon was a spear was called a spearman. The spears reflected the specifics of the Mongolian military art. Their tips were long and narrow. Sometimes below the blade, the spear had a hook that was used to pull an enemy off of their horse. Archery units did not engage in close combat with the enemy. The main tactics of the shooters was to shower the enemy with arrows from a maximum distance. At a distance of up to 100 meters, an archer was able to pierce through armor of his opponent. The Golden Horde warriors had horses of the best breeds. Some were fast and agile, while others were sturdy and low maintenance. The horses were trained not to be afraid of battle noises and the clash of weapons. They were able to overcome obstacles, cross shallow rivers, and climb rocky hills. Their masters tried to protect them by putting on special horse armor. When resting, the soldiers did not sit idly by. They were constantly busy doing things. Some prepared equipment and others looked after horses, while some engaged in household activities. Scholars know well what armor was worn by the Hans and the superior military leaders. However, much less is known about the clothes and weapons of common soldiers of the Golden Horde. Under the outer garments, common Mongolian warriors wore swing shirts. The cuts were quite simple. The neck was either rounded or triangular, and the shirt could be worn wide and long, but never below the knee. The sleeves were long and could be tied with a ribbon. Such undershirts were more often dark colors, blue, brown, or dark red. They were sewn from cotton fabric and also rarely from silk.
The Mongols wore wide pants, usually made of material denser than from the shirt. Pants were ankle long and were almost always covered with outerwear. The main type of clothing of the Mongols was a quilted robe, or as it was called, a kaftan. It was mid-calf length with a slanted wrap over. The sleeves were either long or short and wide. The noble warriors dressed in long, unbuttoned kaftans made of expensive fabrics. Sometimes they sewed large round buttons on them. Over the shirt and dressing gowns, they were chainmail called katangul digil, that is, soft leather armor suits with metal plates attached to them. The shoulders were protected by eyelets. In order to protect their arms, warriors wore leather shields on their forearms, covered with metal plaques or plates. They had two halves tied with leather bands. The boots, which were called gutals, served as footwear for the Mongols. They were made of thick leather with upward toes. Sometimes the boots were made of soft leather, suede or even felt, but with a thick sole attached to them. The design of the warrior's footwear was adapted to ride in hard saddles during a rapid race. Interestingly, the Mongolian horsemen never wore spurs on their boots. In cold and windy weather, the Mongolians wore a lumbar insulation heater called a bildik. It was made of felt, fabric, or fur. Since insulation was worn all over their clothing, it was the most elegant part of the costume and was decorated with embroidery and applique. They were kept on the body with strings. There was also a leather belt with a set of various details. The warriors attached weapons to their belts and fastened them over their outer clothing. The Mongolians wore a wide variety of headdresses, but most often they wore a typical hat made of felt and fur called a malgai. They were trimmed with velvet or silk. The hat was usually conical. It reliably protected the warrior against cold and piercing wind. Often the hat was decorated with fox or wolf fur. The armor of the soldiers of the Golden Horde the zirtsala was a breastplate which was made of polished metal plates sewn onto the fabric. They protected the chest and the back and were rectangular or round in shape. The hatang was meant a kaftan strong as steel. The iron plates were sewn onto the quilted robe. The Khalkha is a round Mongolian shield made of twigs. In the center of the shield was a metal circle that protected the warrior's head. Khalkhans were shields with a diameter of 60 to 70 centimeters. Often these shields were lined with metal. For the Mongolian bow, the pulling force was 70 kilograms. This is noticeably more than a European bow. The effective shooting range was up to 200 or 300 meters. The Mongolian warriors had two bows, 
One was long and the other was short. Two or three quivers each contained about 30 arrows. The Mongols used a special tactic they called wolf. During a surprise attack, the main forces moved in silence, in close formation, at a regular pace. Warriors carrying banners were chosen from the best. The banners marked the line of battle and participated in the signal transmission system. The banner was also a symbol of the Mongolian army. The Nukir is a military leader's personal bodyguard. Their equipment was always expensive and of a high quality. The Nukirs carried swords made of the finest steel. The main weapons of the Mongolian lightly armed horsemen were sabers, bows, darts and axes. The peculiarity of the equipment of the heavily armed horseman was his powerful leather scaly armor and pointed helmet. The body of his horse was also covered with two armor plates, assembled from long leather bands. Before the main forces attack, the Mongolian archers massively fired at the enemies. Such a shooting attack is not easy. Archers had to stand in such a way that they can see the target and not interfere with each other. It's amazing how diverse the arrowheads of the Golden Horde warriors were. Thanks to the numerous archaeological findings, we can see this diversity. The tips were made from iron or animal bones. They were of different shapes, such as oval-winged, sectorial, hexagonal, or oval with a concave tip. Some of the arrowheads were striking in their size. They were almost the size of an adult palm. The axe is the most typical example of a utility tool that turned into a weapon. The axe is much easier to make than a sword and is more versatile. At close range, an axe can be used as a throwing weapon that can easily penetrate armor. The impact of an axe blow is very high due to its large mass. Warriors could also inflict crushing blows with the butt of an axe. Not every Mongolian warrior had a sword. A good sword is a complex item. 
Sometimes blacksmiths could use steel of different characteristics to make the blade. The cost of the sword was significant, so most often only military leaders and nobility could afford to possess such a weapon. The sheath was a permanent sword accessory, a case for carrying and storing it. The sheath was made from various materials, from metal, leather, wood, and fabric. The bladed weapon also had a short double-edged blade and a hilt called a dagger. It was used in close combat and in a fight with the enemy. Among the Mongols, daggers were a very common type of cold weapon. They were small in size and came in different shapes. The scabbard for a dagger was most often made of wood or leather. The shield is a military defensive armor, which the Mongol warrior used to defend themselves against the cold, as well as throwing weapons. Most of the shields were made of wood, twigs, and leather, shackled with bronze or iron. The shields came in different shapes, but most often, the Golden Horde warriors used small, round shields. The composite bow was the main weapon of the Mongols. The complex shape of the bow gave the launched arrow additional energy and high flight speed. The arrows had impressive power and destructive force. The bow, with all of its advantages, was a rather capricious weapon. It had to be protected from dampness and temperature extremes. To do this, the warriors kept it in a special case, a bow case which together with the quiver made up a set called a Sidak. The army of the Mongols, which continued to conquer more and more territories, gradually accumulated a great experience in siege technology. They went from using the most primitive methods of taking cities to the most advanced ones. Their weapons were subdivided into stationary ones and mobile ones, which had wheels. This is an arrow launcher that shot large arrows. The arrow flight range was up to 500 meters. Stone mortars were used to destroy the enemy's stone walls. The stones could weigh about 60 kilograms. They flew a distance of up to 200 meters, and they were a formidable weapon for the besieged city. The Mongols were also armed with martinets, which threw fire pitchers behind the fortress walls. These shells were spherical, earthen vessels charged with a combustible mixture. A moving siege tower was rolled up to the city walls. The warriors inside of it tried to get over the walls of the fortress. Ladders which were attached to the moving platforms were mobile, allowing the Mongol soldiers to successfully storm the high walls. Special battering rams were intended to destroy the gates of the fortress. The weapon was rolled up to the enemy gates and destroyed them. Often there was a cover on the ram, which protected the soldiers against arrows and stones of the defenders. Thanks to the technical equipment of the army, the soldiers of the Golden Horde were able to take over just about any fortified fortress of a city.
the armor of the Golden Horde warriors. The Laminar was the name of a traditional Mongolian armor. It consisted of small leather, iron, or bone plates tied together or sewn onto some kind of base. The leather armor was not lighter in weight than the iron armor. It was made of a very thick and tough leather, two or three layers. Several layers of resin were also applied to it. Such a shell was even somewhat heavier than an iron one. The medieval armorers learned to forge slightly curved double-edged sabers to be used against the Mongols. They could pierce the multi-layered armor of the Mongols, which could not be cut with a slashing bow. In the Mongolian Empire, camels were also used to cross rivers. The base of the Mongolian bow was called a kibit. From the outside, animal tendons were glued to it which, like rubber, had the ability to stretch and contract. The Mongols tempered arrowheads in a special way. They were red hot and then thrown into salt water. As a result, the head became so hard that it could pierce iron armor. It took about two years to make a bow. The wood must be dried well before being used as a body. blacksmith's shop was necessary in a military campaign. After encounters, Mongol warriors needed to repair their weapons, armor, and other military equipment. Therefore, the Mongols adapted to transport small forges with them. They could be easily and quickly deployed to camp and set to work. The main reason for the Mongols' victory was the superiority of the army in everything. The equipment of soldiers, weapons, mobility, technical equipment, and tactics. The Mongols managed to create the best army in the world, which had no equal. During the reign of Genghis Khan, most Mongols adhered to the traditional pagan beliefs of shamanism. They had many customs and rituals. Tribes worshipped various animals, plants, and other pagan gods. At the beginning of the 14th century, Uzbek Khan became the ruler of the Golden Horde. He declared Islam the official religion of the state. In our next program, we will talk about the rights, customs, and beliefs of the Golden Horde.